why don't I get started? I, I see many familiar faces, uh, one or two that are, are not so familiar, but let me welcome a couple people that, um, well, actually a few people that some might not know. First of all, um, I'm delighted that my colleagues, um, Peter Margelist and uh, Serena Gubler, are here, they're sitting in the third row. Peter is the uh, president of the foundation board of EGS. So some of you are under the impression that I answer to no one. In fact, it's wrong. I answer to this guy. <laughs> and, um, the, uh, and, and Serena helps us in our, actually our new office in Visp, uh, Vish, Vish uh, or uh, Viege, as uh, Peter says. Serena is uh, one of the administrative officers there. And then we have two visitors, and I, 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 two friends from, uh, I, I guess like, may I say new friends, from the Fondazione Patrimonio Malti, I don't know how to pronounce it, forgive me, but Lisa and Sarah um, have come, I've just, just really, I've met Lisa, Lisa today and Sarah at, the, um, at their office, which is very beautiful, and they have, uh, they have done some fantastic exhibitions. Um, the last one was, was on music and musical instruments, and there's one upcoming which she has been discussing with, uh, particularly with Robert Young and I, on the topic of the line. And this is getting everybody excited, this topic. So we're looking, it's two years from now, right? We're shooting for two years. So I'm hoping that the EGS in its Malta um, uh, guys will be, uh, will be joining uh, in some measure, or at least uh, supporting as much as possible this, uh, this event on the line, uh, which is, sponsored by this really quite fascinating, fascinating but important private foundation, which is devoted to the Maltese uh, heritage. And um, Sarah, in, in particular, is playing a very important role in helping to bring this into a contemporary um, perspective. So it's, and it's a, I have to say, it's quite impressive. Um, the, you might see, if you look around, you'll see a magazine called Treasures, Treasures of Malta, it's very beautifully done, and the, this foundation does it. Um, okay, I had thought, uh, I, I thought of trying to do a kind of free reflection on what has happened in the course of this month. And then I took a measure of my fatigue <laughs> and the fact that I've been teaching six hours today and meetings nonstop, and I really doubt that I can do anything of uh, any, any uh, import or significance about what has unfolded in the past 24 days. But there have been some, some very interesting, um, very, very interesting moments. Um, and I have a partial perspective because I've participated in some of those moments. And of course, as you know, we have two sets of seminars going. So if I'm participating in one, I don't know what's going on in the other. And so the, I, have a, I have a very partial view. I don't, I don't have an overview of, of the session. But uh, I, there was one thing, a couple, I want to note a couple of very um, distinctive moments. And one of these came in the seminar called Alter Eco, uh, where, which, was, which is short for Alternative Economies, Alternative Ecologies. Alter Eco, and that's a cute name. Um, but they, what was interesting in particular, well, there were many interesting interventions there. Um, Natalie, Dan Hughes's partner, was talking about blockchain. Uh, we had Eric Bordelot talking about quantum economy in a very, uh, very interesting um, philosophical way. Um, Niklaus Damiris also talking about matters quantum in relation to um, finance. Um, but we had, in, there was one man who, wait, we hadn't uh, invited, but was able to come at the last minute. His name is Gary Dirks. Um, he runs the Center for Sustainability at the Arizona State University, and he's a um, colleague of uh, 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 Xinwei, Sha Xinwei. Gary um, is responsible and is in a past life for developing the presence of BP in China. So this is a very, very highly placed businessman with a, a very intimate view of the Chinese economy and uh, the Chinese, the economy of China in relation to the global context. And Gary um, 
Gary has continued after that, I, and maybe he's atoning for sins, I don't know, but his, his topic now is sustainability and the broad systems of human ecology. Um, systems pertaining to health, to food, and then to the environment itself. And he's working at very, very high levels um, in, in, in helping businesses and governments think about um, these, these systems and how to plan for you know, for Gary, he talks about the next 100 years. Um, he's, he's talking in a very broad scale. And he has some very interesting things to say about how planning is unfolding in relation to the environment, for example. His, his argument is that the plans are already set for the next 100 years, about 60 to 70 percent. That, that there's a small margin left of, uh, of, of planning to undertake in terms of the directions that will be taken with regard to energy and, um, and ecology. Well. I mention this because as the seminar unfolded, Gary and I got farther and farther into a discussion about the role of the humanities in relation to thinking about these various systems and the partners with whom one might be thinking. Um, I mentioned he works at very high levels. He was one of the ones who organized the recent Vatican papers on the, their positions regarding carbon tax and, and ecology. Um, and Gary's view is that it's absolutely essential to bring the humanities to the table in these discussions. And I have always um, felt this, and I was, I was really heartened to hear this from somebody who's working at, in these ways. And um, Gary was particularly interested in the way in which the EGS is attempting a form of research that's quite open-ended and brings together people from a number of different, different disciplines, which is what we were doing in the um, Alter Eco Seminar bringing them together for a, a really quite free reflection at a very high level. And Gary was particularly interested in the, sort of the form of hospitality in this discussion, the way in which the conversation was unfolding. And he, I think we will be working with, perhaps with Gary in the future. Um, there are a couple projects. He described one to us in particular, which is frankly alarming. It's the it's a situation in Guyana. Um, I'm hoping that we will be able to join in some way in, in discussions relating to this and, and find a way for the humanities to be in conversation with um, different, uh, well, interlocutors that the humanities have traditionally not found their way to and tables that the humanists have not found their way to. Now, I also had conversations in Monaco on this topic, and I'm hoping that we will be able to work with them in the area of ecology in particular relating to oceanographics. And um, again, I think it's a matter of trying to reconceive our place with respect to various uh, discussions going on. And this links to what Achille Mbembe was saying um, a few nights ago, you'll remember. Achille was saying that effectively to deal with the problems that face us now, we have to turn, he was saying, to forms of science, whether this be geography or uh, uh, he had a whole sphere, astrophysics, um, and when he mentioned astro, no, it was astrobiology, I think it was. And, and when he mentioned that, I had just seen in the newspaper a story from an astrobiologist who was claiming that humans are going to spoil the universe. I, thought, I, I, I refrained from mentioning this to um, Ashin. But anyway, um, but Ashin was talking about the uh, absolute imperative of bringing forward for the humanities these discursive uh, forms of these forms of research in the different sciences. And what I was struck by was Achille's sort of, I don't want to say failure, but it wasn't a failure, but the fact that he wasn't talking about the imperative of bringing the humanities into discussion with these. He was, he was simply pointing to the, the, the imperative of, of bringing these, these, these discussions to the, forum, to the fore in our uh, context. Whereas I've, I, I, I wonder whether we shouldn't be actually um, conceiving a, a form of dialogue where the humanities are at the table with them. And, um, and this, I think, is something to, to be worked for. Um, and particularly because Achille, in the course of this, was, and this is a point on which we, he and I entirely agree, was arguing that it's, it's imperative that we begin to think what he was calling a, something like a common ground in terms of human endeavors. And he was speaking of the human race in these terms. We started asking whether race is the right term. Maybe it's the hum human genre, maybe it's the human kind. Or, but the necessity of a philosophical approach to the question of what constitutes the human. And uh, I, I happen to agree with him, and that's what I'm 
trying to do a little bit in my own um, uh, seminar right now. But it's also a, a bit what um, Matt Dryhurst and, and uh, Holly Herndon were talking about with regard to um, artificial intelligence and their research in music and generating music through um, application of, uh, or exploration in artificial intelligence. And they were talking about the human share in this exploration, this research. I can't remember the exact phrase they were using. Maybe you remember this pneumonia for the human part, the human, human play involved. But they were insistently coming back to the question of agency and, well, they were attending to something I asked about with respect to the notion of a gesture. Um, what is, how do we think about the gesture in using artificial intelligence, and given that a, a, a computing system or the, the looping involved in artificial intelligence and the training cannot bring a computer to enact a gesture in a historical sense? So anyway, um, the question of the human has been coming up, and that has been a very interesting um, thread through our discussions. But I have to say, I was um, the last moment I wanted to point to, which was exciting for me, was this juxtaposition of uh, Robert Young's work with what we were calling, and now this name is falling away, I should announce this, we're not going to be using this anymore, the $3 violin. Um, the juxtaposition of the $3 violin with the, um, that creative black box that uh, Holly and Matt were describing to us, which they call Spawn. And uh, Spawn is fascinating because they, this is, they're playing at the idea that this is their Spawn, right? this is their, their creation, this is their child, and they, they limit the amount of information that it's given in its training. And the question kept coming up for me, well, so how old is Spawn now? You know, how do we think about the, the development and the maturation of a, of a black box of that kind, which is teaching itself? Um, but anyway, they, they, there was an extraordinary juxtaposition within the a matter of a day of that um, instance of research that Holly and Matt were undertaking with artificial intelligence and music with what uh, Robert Young was doing with this creation of an instrument, which is actually a, an extraordinary condensation of gifts coming from uh, uh, fields of scientific research and technology. I'm thinking of the lab in Norway that treats the wood. I'm thinking of the laboratory in Cambridge, which does the digital cutting to prepare the pieces for this violin that will be assembled by children. Donations by wood um, uh, suppliers um, who, who supply instrument makers. Uh, donations on the part of a couple of the most famous luthier in the world. That's Robert and his friend uh, Peter Grenier, who are uh, thinking about this. Together with a, a group of assistants, um, we've met several of them, Antonin, Jason, um, uh, Julia, Julia I, I can't remember all the last names, but I'll just, there, there's a, there is a quite a collective at work in trying to develop a violin which captures the sound of a Stradivari from 1726, um, but in a manner that allows this to be produced at a cost which Robert brought down to effectively $3, once you count all the donations. And it is an incredible condensation or constellation in, a, in an object of, you know, as I say, science, technology, a kind of activism in terms of the charity that he has with distributing these um, instruments to children, um, a giving in the, in the sense of that, and then also musical knowledge, the music that this uh, violin um, enables, the craft in assembling it and then playing it. And so it it's, it's a remarkable condensation of humanities and sciences, in fact, um, which then allows the um, possibility of thousands of violins will be, which will be going to kids in underprivileged neighborhoods. And you know, what is the effect of that? I mean, it's in terms of a, of a gesture on the part of the EGS, which is in some measure helping, and is also donating in this process, helping Robert think about it and um, bring about some of the techniques that are required for um, assembly by children. I mean, he's experimenting with us. These are laboratories, these seminars, and, and we're working toward both the, the design of the violin and also the, the design which will accommodate the, the, um, the building on the part of the children. So 
um, there's this, I, I was just stunned by the research, you know, a, a juxtaposition in two days, the research going into the black box called Spawn um, on the part of Matt and Holly, which is an incredible condensation of research in artificial intelligence, mathematics, com computational thinking, and work with computers, and at the same time, musical knowledge. I mean, we, heard, we saw them deploy an incredible um, engagement with contemporary music and you know, pulling these things together. It was one of the, I, I have to say, I've, been, I've heard more than once in, um, um, in the past couple of years, discussions of AI and art. I haven't encountered anything quite like what we heard the other night. I, I don't know if others felt that, but I was feeling very, very moved by this, uh, the strength of what they were presenting. And so we had this, uh, this striking juxtaposition of this, this incredible sedimented object which was before us, the $3 violin, um, given it, a historical sedimentation, technological sedimentation, the chain of donations, the community, the collaboration involved in producing it. You know, it has a very curious and special status, which we're still, still trying to think about. Um, that object and then this other object which was being described to us in some measure played for us in the, um, in the context of the artificial intelligence. And, you know, the question of objecthood was presenting itself to me um, and obviously the position of, uh, you know, what it is for, the, for, for us to think as a community engaged in a form of craft and then what it is to think as a community in this development of artificial intelligence, which transforms the very notion of community. So it was, I think, I thought an extraordinary moment of research and it was almost overwhelming. You know, it's, it's like a, the water hit the, uh, the, the rock hit the uh, pond and we, we've got ripples and entanglements and uh, you know, waves going in all sorts of directions and I think we have, still have a lot of thinking to, to do to assimilate it. So anyway, those are just a few of the thoughts that I had. Um, I just wanted to add in terms of this idea of the humanities um, joining the table in different and new ways. Uh, I, I, I'm looking forward to seeing the EGS in, in the PAC division go out to different sites and we'll start doing this in the coming year. I can't really announce these as yet, but there will be, there's a beginning with them, the, the Institute for Critical Studies in Mexico City called 17. We'll be going into a collaboration with them. So. Um, EGS is going to be globalizing in a new way. And what excites me about that is instead of trying to invite people from around the world in this globalizing effort to come join us um, in, in our sites, which, which remain our core sites, um, we'll be going out to them. Uh, the idea is, is to go out for dialogue, to go out to join others in conversation. And uh, so it's, not a, it's certainly not about a, uh, how could I say, a, 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 we're not seeking branch campuses for some sort of um, colonial <laughs> purpose, but rather it's about going out and finding partners and, and engaging in forms of dialogue. So that's an exciting part of what I think we're preparing now and what this session has been helping us prepare and thinking about different forms of conversation, different forms of hospitality and, and engagement. Okay, I, I've gone on actually a bit more than I thought. I want to present to you um, an essay which um, is not new, but it remains, um, it remains very much, uh, it's kind of haunting me. And I have been thinking about it again because I've been, I've been thinking about the place of philosophy in our program. And I have been sensitive to the way in which the political uh, urgency of the moment is starting to shape the direction in which some of our discourses are going. And I'm a, I'm a little bit concerned, actually, about the, um, the philosophical uh, dimension, which I think is essential to what we do in the PAC division of the EGS, philosophy, art, and critical thought. Um, because I think it, it's, if we don't maintain the idea of a philosophically informed critical thought, then our critical thinking may be extremely prey to ideology. And I think it's important to, to maintain a certain freedom, even, at, even in this difficult moment of uh, you know, urgency of taking positions, of defining critical positions, and I mean, which I agree with completely. And I think you know, the, the aims of going toward 
discussions about ecology, about human systems. These are all about trying to render our thinking more concrete, more concretely engaged, more worldly, and so forth. But at the same time, I think it has to remain a thinking engagement. That, that, that what distinguishes EGS is a philosophical approach to theory. And um, so I'm, I want to talk a little bit about how, I, how I've understood that from the basis of an example that has informed me for a long time, and that is the work of Jean-Francois Lyotard. This is, a, a, um, I wrote this paper on the occasion of a conference on the topic of, that took the, um, the theme of disaster. And I said, well, okay, I can talk about that because I think we're living in a time of disaster. But I also happen to work a lot on Blanchot who thinks a lot about disaster. So I was in a, in, in, in a proper context. But I wanted to talk about teaching in, the con in a context of disaster. And so this is a text on um, teaching, which is a teaching that approaches disaster and is in some sense on the verge of disaster, even as it tries to speak to the ambient or environing disaster. So, as I say, I've been haunted by this essay as I think about philosophy and particularly on pedagogy um, in a university setting, ours, which is a very experimental setting. And so I, I want to then, I want to come back to this text for this reason. It, it has been, as I say, it's been with me. It doesn't quite go away. I'm referring here to a brief essay by Jean-Francois Lyotard that was first published in Critique in 1978 under the title Endurance and the Profession. It's a rather enigmatic text. In fact, it's a very dark text. But it's enigmatic for the fact that it, what is named endurance goes entirely undefined in it. And as I say, in what is on, on its face a rather dark and despairing reflection. What does it mean to endure in these conditions? It's almost as though endurance stands in lieu of that for which it might serve, but which cannot be named. Some hope, for example. So I remain astonished and intrigued by this essay, but I leave, believe I may now understand something of why it has so haunted me. So I would like to take my orientation from it. And I'm going to try to talk about my work in relation to this a little bit. Whether or not I'm correct in my intuitions, I can at least offer it as an, as an example of what I might want to try to think of as a pedagogy of disaster, or at least what might be a step towards such a thing. The disaster to which this text speaks uh, first figures at an institutional level. The desiccating forces that have brought the severe conditions we know today throughout the world, whether this be in first-rate North American universities or in universities throughout Europe, Eastern Europe, and then other parts of the world, the desiccating forces that have brought the severe conditions we know today were already clearly in ascendancy in the decade after 1968. All of what we are witnessing, and I look in the UK where I taught for 10 years, where we, I saw a gradual uh, strangling of the university under technocratic imperatives. Um, all, of these, all of these forces were in ascendancy already in the 1970s and were, were quite visible. Um, Lyotard was writing about them in that text called The Postmodern Condition, which many of you will know. So Lyotard uh, starts out in this text, he says, it has become an enviable rarity these days to obtain a salary in exchange for the kind of discourse that is commonly called philosophy. As the 20th century draws to a close, the statesmen and families who run the French secondary school system seem to want to have nothing to do with it. That's very pertinent today in France. There are new reforms underway which are really dismantling the French um, uh, pedagogical structure in, with regard to philosophy. The, French, the families that run the French secondary school system seem to want to have nothing to do with it. For according to the spirit of the times, which is theirs, to do is to produce. That is to reproduce with surplus value. Those who teach philosophy are thus condemned to decimation or worse, while those who have studied it remain unemployed or give themselves up as hostages to other professions. Now, Lyotard at this time had not hesitated to cast his lot with those who occupied the most extreme edge of the spreading disaster, namely the philosophy group at Vincennes, which by the time of Lyotard's account of his experience there had lost its right to grant degrees. Here was a university almost, as Derrida put it in a famous essay on the university, sans titre and sans condition. And yet the students kept coming. 
and this is for courses for people like Deleuze and, and Guattari, Lyotard, Badieu, Rancière, I think Rosaire a bit, um, but a number of very famous figures. But they were teaching in a university that had no accreditation in, in the sense that it could offer um, degrees. They had, they had some state support, but no, uh, no titre, you might say. But the students kept coming. The want of conditions, the lack of any formal justification or even any required structure, the utterly minimal state support also, together with the strange persistence of the students, prompted in Lyotard a radical questioning regarding his political stance, his pedagogical stance, excuse me. In this situation of radical freedom and radical destitution, radical freedom because he was told he can do anything he want, radical destitution because the French state was saying it doesn't count for anything, Radical freedom and radical destitution, he was effectively disappropriated of any pre-given or institutionally sanctioned professorial authority. It's not entirely unlike the EGS, where we tell the professors, go ahead, do anything you want. In fact, we're not going to tell you what we want you, what we want you to do. We want you to, do, uh, we want you to uh, assume academic freedom, absolutely. Do what you want. And what's interesting in that is that, uh, as students note, and it happened again yesterday in my seminar, Somehow, at the end of six seminars, everybody who's doing whatever the hell they want ends up doing stuff that's pretty similar in certain ways. They come to similar questions, similar, uh, not necessarily similar answers, but they're tracing similar trajectories as they go through these passages that I tried to describe in the first, in our orientation session as a series of passages in thought into a concrete questioning. And somehow, there are these strange convergences that go on in the course of the six seminars. Well, why? Because we've got a certain set of people who have somewhat similar training, but are living in the same time and are trying to get to the same state of the world. And they, uh, they produce, um, from their respective ways, quite strikingly convergent um, discourses. Anyway, and we don't have any state support. <laughs> so we are destitute and we give freedom. Um, and it's, so it's not unlike Vincent. So an imagined interlocutor queries Lyotard, he, he's, he's imagining an interlocutor coming to him to, say, to ask, all right, well, what does all this mean? What, what kind of situation is this? A university sans condition, sans titre, and uh, so, so freely um, uh, undertaking its, its undefined task. So the, the, the person asks, does that mean that each teacher in your department speaks of what he or she likes? No. It means that no one is protected, and above all, in his or her own eyes, by prescribed rules. And everyone must give his or her name to what he or she says without pleading necessity. And everyone, like a stutterer, must head towards what he or she wants, to, wants, what wants in order to say it. They have to go toward what they want in order to say it. The interlocutor says, you're exaggerating. Neotas, don't forget. They wait for you every week and without telling you what they're expecting. All the same, you know what you're driving at, the interlocutor objects. But no, Lyotas says, he does not know. What has motivated his, him is something less than an idea, something more like an impulsion, a strength or a weakness, he writes, that has led him to undertake meticulous examinations of ancient rhetoric, such as, I quote, the machinery of an anti strephon put in the mouth of Protagoras by, Diog by Diogenes Laertes. Let me pause for a second. I'm not going to read you um, a description of the anti strephon unless somebody really wants that. I, I got it because I, my memory is not strong enough to remember all the details. So I, got, I have it next to me if anybody wants to see it. But it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a quite complicated rhetorical ploy by which Protagoras sets up a situation with a student where he can only win in, uh, in, a, in court with him. And I, I add also that when I met Jean-François Lyotard, it was a, a transformative experience for me. And I've been hoping that some of you have such experiences when you meet some of our faculty. I, I, I met this guy and I immediately said, this is what I hope I can become someday as an intellectual. It wasn't an identification. It was I saw someone who was performing intellectual life in a way that said, this is, this is it. This is what I want. So, uh, and, and I met him in a seminar in which he was doing these rhetorical exercises, and I have to be honest with you, it was one of the most boring seminars I have ever sat in. It was unbearable as he was going through all the steps in this rhetorical machinery. But afterwards, he started talking about what he was doing, and I said, whoa, okay, this is, this is, something, this is something else. 
So I guess I'm trying to say, be patient sometimes. <laughs> be patient, because there, there may be more going on than you quite recognize. So the interlocutor is incredulous before this uh, statement that Lyotard says he doesn't know where he's going. He just doesn't know. So the interlocutor says, but you too, you want something, right? And Lyotard says, well, when younger, you might have wanted to please or to help or to lead by argument or by revelation. Now it's all over. You no longer know exactly what's wanted. How can you make others understand what you haven't really understood? But when the course works out well, you also know that since you made them understand what you didn't, it didn't really work out. The anguish when you enter the classroom, especially at the beginning of the year, is not the stage fright of the actor or the orator, although it can be, the feeling of claustrophobia, all of us will burn in here, that was Vincent, or the predicament of not knowing everything, which is rather reassuring. It's rather the sovereign pressure of an imbecilic, you must go there, which does not say where. So the dominant affect in this position of absolute freedom and destitution at the same time is anguish. And the impulse comes to be phrased in an insistent, uh, Lyotard's impulse to do this, to go ahead, to continue, to endure in the profession, as he says. The impulse comes to be phrased in an insistent but obscure imperative. Il faut y aller. And the E here is utterly defined. In other words, you have to go there. But there is undefined. Il faut y aller. This situation is not without its absurdity, which Lyotard illustrates with an anecdote I know he loved. Just two years ago, this or that leftist commando was bursting in, denouncing the magisterial function, the star system, alienation, apathy, cutting the electricity, raising his clubs, locking up the teacher a while, and abusing the students. To ponder a metalepsis in the narration of Book Nine of the Laws is not futile, it's criminal. They know where to go. We used to fight a bit. Only once did it lead to something worthwhile. And he goes on here to describe how his group, in the course of a strike at Vincennes, there were constant strikes, took to studying the rhetoric of the language employed in the strike. Confronted by the militants, who were furious that he, they were going on teaching in the course of the strike, confronted by the militants, it was possible for Lyotard and his students to demonstrate that their work was not in fact distinguishable, subtracting a reflective turn or two, from the kind of work or activity enjoined by the strikers themselves. The militants, shaking their heads, let them be. Now, it might be suggested that Lyotard illustrates with this story something not unrelated to the play of the anti-Strephon, which, as he will later tell us, he might once have taken as a valuable political maneuver. I'll return to this point because it's crucial for understanding the curiously apolitical stance that Lyotard describes. It's a strange evocation of a certain futility even a melancholic neutrality that some, and certainly the strikers, might find offensively academic. But I want to continue first with Lyotard's account of the pedagogical experience, which is suffused with anxiety. I quote, the rhythm of work in progress seems tentative and peaceful, but on the occasion of each of these pointless classes, it becomes asceticism, impatience, and fear. You get up well before dawn and you tell yourself, this particular, this particular part of the current work has to be done for tonight. For example, express the temporal logic of Protagoras' anti-Strephon before midnight. Because the day after tomorrow, you must explain it to those who are waiting for you by looking straight at them and not at your notes. And as you aren't protected by an institution, make them furthermore understand that it's opportune or bearable to speak about such things. Now, I have to say, sometimes teaching Heidegger, I'm exactly in that position. I have to try to explain how it's opportune or bearable to be teaching such a text or, or justifiable. But I, I, Lyotard was doing this. I, I, he was up at five in the morning doing this, this presentation and then trying to figure out how to confront these, these people to talk about what appeared to be a pointless exercise. So I assume, I've emphasized that he feels he must assume the argument to the point of being able to communicate it without evasion without the appeal to notes. Again, this is a situation of exposure. He's exposed before these people. And he must be capable of communicating how this exercise can be justified. The outward honesty of this effort, by which I mean the unguarded character of the address and the effort to legitimate without pre-existing legitimation, is then matched, he goes on to say, by an equal demand on the self. One must undertake the work without relying on received commentary and in such a way that one will be actually transformed by it. Transformed by it, he says. Lyotard 
I recall, is talking about the analysis of an antistrephon attributed to Protagoras or some other, and yet he treats this as a form of experience, even a trial. Experiences I was reminding today is erfahrung, which means passage through a, through a danger or, um, of some kind. So he treats this curious analysis of uh, rhetoric as, as, a, as a form of experience to which I can only say the life of the mind is a peculiar thing and will never cease to astonish. And yet, I believe we all know something of what he has evoked here, namely the experience of a passage in thought that has somehow changed the state of one's intellectual being. I'm hoping that a few of you have experienced something like this in, in, this, in the seminars, in this session, or as we do in each session. And that's what we're supposed to be doing, right? We're supposed to be attending to questions, we, the faculty, are supposed to be tending to questions in such a way that going to where we're seeking, which is vague, will be a transformative experience for all concerned. That, that it will, things will not be the same afterwards. Our condition as teacher is a modest one, but if and when we teach, if we truly teach, our manner of occupying our world shifts. We experience a displacement of horizons. We imagine frequently enough that our teaching is changing the world to the great amusement of even those who live near us. And we have actually, or let us say that we have touched and thereby subtly altered the worldhood of our world for ourselves. We've changed our relation to our being in the world. And in some measure for those who have accompanied us. Nothing has changed at least visibly. And yet everything in a brief passage has changed and is left with a self-effacing mark of this indemonstrable shift, this brief brush against what we might want to call disaster. Miyatar won't say this, but I believe we touch here on one of the keys to endurance, and we have a little hint of what it means to go there. Of course, all of this is undertaken in the most extreme doubt. The voice comes from the back of his mind. You aren't cut out for thinking. You're a philosopher. You believe it's not natural to think. You're envious of, but after all, you disdain your colleagues and friends who work in the human sciences, who seem to be in symbiosis with their work, who have a corpus, a method, a bibliography, a strategy, exchanges. They know where to go. That's what makes you different from even those close to you, like historians of philosophy, whom you admire nonetheless. You like, unlike these historians, in other words, these disciplinarily supported um, people who aren't attempting this free thinking that he's describing, you like what is unfinished. Nothing of what you write will be authoritative. You lend yourself willingly to this prescription to go there without knowing where. You're certain that nobody can do it, least of all yourself. You know you're doing what you're not cut out to do. You're an imposter. You hate all this. Little by little, you cease to draw any vanity from it. You can see why I'm identifying with this. And what is all this? Again, I underscore that he was studying rhetorical operators in the most fastidious manner possible. Fastidious, sometimes tedious, because he was undoing, this is what the work was, he was undoing every assumption that might be based on his prior position in Parisian intellectual circles or on expectations regarding the meaning of practicing philosophy at Vincennes in the company of figures such as Gilles Deleuze. He was undermining, he, he was undoing himself publicly in this context which demanded a different relation to the practice of thought, which demanded a more concrete, more uh, risky, experimental, and ultimately, as I say, more concrete form of engagement with where he was. He was undermining every position and every posture that might be attributed to him on this stage, refusing to declare what should be thought in the current conjecture, conjuncture, excuse me, as would a maître à penser, and refusing to pronounce on what can't be thought, as would a maître à penser. He would leave to others, he said, the task of naming the unnameable, saying the unsayable, conceiving the unconceivable, pronouncing the unpronounceable, or deciding the undecidable. Today we might add thinking the uncomputable. His task was without such commitments and obeyed a different form of exigency. So what was he doing? Why did he imagine that these rhetorical analyses could serve some honest end he declined to identify in anything but the most minimal fashion? On the penultimate page, he approaches an answer. You try for two kinds of understanding. First, that which permits you tomorrow to situate the antistrephon of Protagoras within the writing of a temporal logic. 
a strong understanding and ultimately useless. This is a mere exercise of thought. The other is totally different. To learn obscurely after months, years of study, why this bizarre verbal argument interested you. You first included it within a general examination of ruse, for example, and that had attracted you because you saw it as a weapon against the powerful. We are weak, you used to say as a justification. All this seemed directed towards some political end. You were inspecting the, in the available arsenal. The anti strephon I'm still citing, found its place naturally in this general strategy, and you studied it as such. So it's a political weapon for the weak against the powerful. Now, two and a half years later, you confess the vanity of your Manichaeism. The anti strephon may very well be a weapon at the disposal of the weak. It is also the strength of philosophical discourse. For this latter is made up of reflexive or speculative statements of which it is one type. Your general approach to paradoxes is modified by it, as are your politics. You say so. Your listeners, especially foreigners from poor countries, believe that with this move you, lo you have lost even more pugnacity, that you have become even more a product of that cold thought and refined style, which they call French, and which exasperates them. Lyotard was clearly not in a position to disabuse these students. He had effectively displaced his relation to the political as such, offering in the wake of what might loosely be termed a deconstruction of previously held assumptions about politics, a dubious nod toward philosophy, alleging that a political dispositif to which he had long had recourse also belonged to the speculative resources of that practice of philosophy. He thought he was doing politics. In fact, he was doing philosophy. So this effort was an effort to deconstruct that structure, to try to understand the hold of philosophy on him via this extremely indirect path. Going there had taken him to the limits of what he meant by politics, conceived as a form of agonistics, and back to a meeting with speculative, speculative thought, which may or may not have been in some way shaken by this exercise. Could this issue, this outcome, possibly serve some political exigency, presuming that what he was seeking there could even be said to be of a political order? Lyotard does not pause over this question. We are immediately presented instead with a further step in the ateleological process of self-dispossession we, we have been following under the name of endurance in the profession. I'll conclude my review of Lyotard's essay with a citation of the last paragraph that presents a kind of leap prepared by his encounter with this unsettling meeting with philosophy at the limits of political thought. I quote, the concessions to what you feel are expected to become rarer. You'd like to neglect even what your own mind desires, make it accessible to thought it doesn't expect. You don't read anymore to strip authors, but to steal away from yourself. You aim at this deculturation in every direction, science fiction, underground cinema, linguistics and similar logics, monsters of plastic and sound, surprising banalities, oblique rereadings. You are unfaithful in your alliances like the barbarians of Clastre, but for a different reason, opposite at least. You are at war with the institutions of your own mind and with your own identity. And you know that with all of this, you're probably only perpetuating Western philosophy, its laborious liber libertinage and its obliging equanimity. At least you also know that the only chance or mischance to do so lies in setting philosophy beside itself. So it's a deconstructive effort to try to escape the hold of philosophy into a different form of encounter. I've referred to this process as one of dispossession. Miata describes it more graphically here as a form of internal war undertaken on the chance that he might thereby displace philosophy itself, which he had now understood to be the horizon of politics as he, has practiced, as he had practiced it to that point as a militant, and he was a militant, and as a philosopher. He won't say it in this essay, and perhaps he could not yet say it, but it is apparent from his later work that he was, in fact, preparing his thought for what he would call the event, which is the advent of a new path of thinking from the ground of a, a form of discovery. I'll come back to this point, but I want to make the transition now to what I proposed in some of my earlier work, which I'm trying to hold on to, I guess, in which I'm convinced could well be described as offering a kind of pedagogy of disaster. I don't want to rehearse the argument for the sake of some retrospective justification, but I do want to try to assume it once more. In effect, 
I'm trying to look back a bit and look afresh in, by returning to Lyotard's essay on endurance. And by returning to Lyotard's essay on endurance, I realized I wrote this, uh, this essay the first time under comparable, con comparable conditions to what I experienced today and have experienced more than once in my career. In a state approaching despair, I was seeking to bear witness to what had become the bankruptcy of the institutions that had formed my intellectual life and the painful abstraction of the political context in which I was seeking to find a place. Now, I have, ha I have found some solace now coming to the EJS in recent years and undertaking the work I'm doing, but until a few years ago, I was indeed facing an incredible bankruptcy in, um, in, in terms of the British institutions I was involved with. Too unsure to say openly that my thinking had led me to question any political construction in currently available terms of the act of teaching, this is what I was talking about ideology a few minutes ago, I sought to describe a practice of thought and teaching that would be without political effects. Without political effects in the, in the sense that it meant becoming what Deleuze and Foucault described as the local intellectual and no longer seeking the, the, the broad um, political intervention of the traditional French intellectual. It would be without political effects, but it would eschew determinant political ends in a necessarily obscure effort to push to the extreme, extreme of what I understood to be the essence of work in the humanities. In a state of perceived disaster at the institutional and political levels, I was pushing toward the disaster at the limits of reason that I had glimpsed in the work of Blanchot and Lacan in particular, seeking thereby some new issue, some new reality, some new relation to a concrete form of question. So my thesis, and this is a book that I wrote some years ago called The Claim of Language, was that the humanities would have to recover the status of a fundamental form of research if they were to survive in the current context. This meant first, as I tried to suggest, that they had to recognize that what they bring forward in their inquiry regarding human experience and language, conceived in a very broad sense of this term, is of fundamental importance for every field of professional endeavor and every dimension of social life, by which I mean to say that every profession presupposes in some measure what is elaborated by in the humanities, beginning with the notion of the human itself. My concern in these first steps of my argument was in part pragmatic. I was trying to offer a case for the humanities. But I went on to argue that this first legitimating step was predicated upon a full exploration of the specific path by which the humanities may actually bring forward a concrete account of human experience. I was pushing back toward what Heidegger termed an existential approach, but I was doing so from the ontological inquiry that the existential analytic was meant to prepare. I mislead here if I suggest that I took a step Heidegger overly, overtly disqualified with his famous turn away from fundamental ontology in the early 1930s. But I'm not entirely sure that it, I did not in fact tape, take that step with Heidegger as I proposed to think the question of the human from the ground of what he had described as the path toward language, alleged, alleging that a practice of this path, what I was calling a pragmatics, could be understood as properly humanistic. Here, I acknowledge I lost many of my potential interlocutors, or at least I suspect I did, because at the crossroads that Foucault had indicated at the order of things, at the end of the order of things, when he said, future knowledge is going to go, gonna have to go in the direction of the human, or it's going to have to go in the direction of language. It can't do both. My thinking was leading to me to think it actually had to do both at the same time. And this is what was at stake in the pragmatics I was trying to think with regard to language. So at that crossroads, Foucault had indicated that at the order of things, I took the direction of a thought of the enoncé, the statement, if you will, that Foucault subsequently laid out in the archaeology of knowledge. This was, in other words, the path of a thought of language. I did so, however, with the sense that I was also traversing the other path, path that he claimed diverged from this first, first, which is a path toward the question of the human. The majority of Foucault's readers, it has to be said, simply took the path of cultural studies, and I parted with most of them altogether along both paths. I lost even Derrida at one point in this process because it was not until the late 1990s that he was prepared to recognize the question of the human. But it was clear to me that a consequent thought, and this is where I, I, Achille and Membe and I are in agreement, I think, in a, in a significant way. It was clear to me that a consequent thought of the being of language would take us back to the question of the human in a way that would exceed the bounds of humanism. 
There I met Lacan, who spoke of the human that suffers the signifier, as well as Blanchot and Lyotard, all three of whom were attentive to the question of disaster, both in the socio-political sense and in the sense of an exposure of thought to something that exceeds its capacity. In thinking this last notion of disaster, all three, as it happens, gave a prominent place to the question of infancy, which Lyotard approached in one of his volumes under the name of the inhuman. And infancy became very important for me. On the one hand, Lyotard argued, I quote, uh, that he, he argued, the inhuman might name the processes at work in the contemporary socioeconomic order, as well as what becomes of the human in such an order, given that these forces require an excising of the unproductive or inassimilable manifestations of human finitude. On the other, this notion of the inhuman which he introduced can name that to which the human is exposed precisely by an experience of its finitude. So in thinking through the inhuman, we come through the human, we come to an inhuman and to a kind of post-humanism, but by following the question of the human. That structure of exposure, as I had come to understand, was available to thought in some measure through a consequent grasp of what both Heidegger and Benjamin had described in their singular ways as the essence of language. The argument I tried to advance here was relatively simple. Heidegger had shown that to think the essence of language, human language at least, we must think how the human lends itself to language. If the event of language is unthinkable apart from something Heidegger termed a use of the human for this event, this is what I was talking about today in the seminar, then it follows that the path to the essence of language is also a path into this usage. Language's speaking, or its presence, as Foucault described it, will always bear the trace of this usage, this human share and the advent of language that is in excess of language itself. From there, we can see that any communication of language, as Benjamin understood it with notions such as communicability or translatability, any, any, way, any instance in which we bring language to speak in the way Heidegger said, any communication, will always entail a communication of something of human finitude or what I've called the structure of exposure that human finitude entails. The pedagogy I proposed on this basis was a pedagogy that involved attending to the communicability of language in its very material instantiation each time it is brought forth as language, which is an event that is repeated whenever art, not just literature, but any art, comes about as such, as when art shows its character as art. Lyotard described this event in terms of an artistic gesture, but I believe I agree with him in thinking that thought itself is also capable of such a gesture when it draws upon language to go to the limits of the concept. Following Heidegger, in other words, I was moving back from the question of language, which I take as the medium of our work in the humanities, to fundamental questions about human being, and I found I was opening onto the fundamental questions posed in psychoanalysis concerning the experience of sexual difference, the opening to reality, and all of the questions of origin that are, are the stuff of primal repression and those first questions posed by children. I was also moving back to the question of mitzayn, being with and thus community, which means I was effectively moving beyond the order of subjectivity and any political relation predicated upon it. I was elaborating a pedagogy of disaster that would leave the horizon of the political which I understood to be the governing horizon of reference in contemporary theoretical and critical work. I'm basically referring to the idea in a lot of critical theory that all is political, that everything is political. And I was suggesting that this is ultimately a totalizing construction which excludes dimensions of experience that have to be brought into thought if we are to engage a concrete politics in the way I was trying to describe it. I was effectively joining Lyotard's pedagogy of disaster in turning aside from this horizon of meaning that all is political for the sake of another thought of relation. And this is where we start approaching what Fred Moten was talking about in August under the name of the undercommons. You remember we were talking about the limits of the political in that context. I've underscored in Lyotard's description of his endurance in the profession, the way in which this meant for him a displacement of what he termed his politics and his conception of the political relation. One might understand this displacement as a kind of shifting of stance or positions, but I believe he was describing something more radical in his effort to exile himself from his previously held positions, political or philosophical. He was seeking the threshold of meaning in a practice that he named in 1988 one of unforgetting 
a practice he would increasingly term anamnesis. So it's the practice of thinking which returns to a, uh, um, an event or um, a repressed in thought that has to be worked toward or worked through. To what, he was, um, to what was he seeking access in this manner? As early as 1988, he declared that he was seeking a dimension of human experience that was, as he put it, intractable with respect to any order of meaning. And he made it explicit that this meant approaching a dimension of experience that eluded politics altogether. Politics, he said, could only forget the exposure to difference that occurs in the relation of being with at the level I've tried to evoke, in which Fred was talking about under the name of the undercommon. What cannot be treated, what is not manageable, once and for all, and what is forgotten by political treatment in its constitution of a commonality of humans, a dint of their belonging to the same polis, is the very thing that is not shareable among them, what is not communicable or communal or common at all. Call it birth or death or singularity. By reason of you know, that, that my, what I'm trying to talk about here with this notion of political, Lyotard cites Nancy, who takes up this point following Philippe Lacroix. But it's clear that the radicality of the statement Lyotard is making about politics leads him much closer to Blanchot here than to Nancy. Adopting a more psychoanalytic, psychoanalytic inflection than Blanchot, however, Lyotard evoked a relation to what he called the thing, la chose, insisting that it cannot be represented in any discourse, philosophical or political, even if it haunts every construction, including the self-representation of the polis. Blanchot came to call this the res publica, <laughs> the, the, the public thing, um, but he's talking about what haunts the, 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 the public space. The thing, Leotard writes, has no place, not having taken place and being present only outside representation. In death, in birth, one's absolute and singular dependency which prohibits any instantiated disposition of oneself from being unitary and total. I would just as well say sexual difference in the most radical sense of a heteronomy that does not belong to the space-time of representation. This is why it can hardly be felt in the soul of the polis. He continues by asserting, however, that while it is only barely felt in the polis, it haunts or insists in the form of affect, what Freud called an unconscious affect. And to the extent that it is felt at the social level, it engages something like the soul of the polis if by soul we mean the part of the spirit that remains, he says, hostage to the thing, that remains susceptible to anguish and defenseless. Here, Lyotard suggests, is the ground of the discontent of civilization and ultimately the paranoia that is manifested in efforts to rid the social body of this intractable resistance to civilized order. I'll cite one more time, Lyotard. The discontent of civilization the sharp and vague feeling that the civilians are not civilized and something is ill-disposed toward civility, all of this easily engenders the suspicion that plots are being hatched. Also engendered are trials, the denunciation of scapegoats, the, the exclusion of the xenos, the accusations made against opposing parties, slander, heuristics, and the idea of revolution too. Polemos is not the father of all things, Leotard writes, he is the child of this relation of the mind to a thing that has no relation to the mind. And polemos, too, is a way for the mind to forget it, to forget the coitus impossibilis that, is engendered, that engendered it and never stops engendering it. I said earlier that Leotard's trial by endurance, conceived as a resistance, both internal and external, against every expectation and every interest that had formed his public position in Vincennes, and he was a celebrity at this time, led him to question the agonistics to which he had devoted himself as a political thinker. By the time he wrote the words I have cited, he had reached the Levinasian understanding that to go there in a writing or a pedagogy of disaster meant finding a different stance altogether, a different form of struggle. This would be a form of non-forgetting or anamnesis that was perhaps not even appropriately called a work. I've suggested that the pedagogy of disaster that Lyotard pursued at Vincennes under the name of endurance was in fact preparatory. His ascetic analysis of rhetorical forms was the first step, was the first step in an accelerating flight from his mind's habits and defenses that took him toward a quite radical form of disappropriation that he identified as the infancy of the mind. It was a pedagogy undertaken in a broader context of disaster that led into a kind of disaster. 
It was a process, as I have suggested, that was not dissimilar to the one he ascribed to artists, but also to the patient in psychoanalysis, a work he says that involves, I quote, leaving open the path by which there can arrive what has not yet arrived, by which, in other words, there may return an opening to what comes. As he says of Picasso in the same essay from which I've just quoted, he has to let himself come to the very threshold of what exceeds him. Of course, a great deal of Lyotard's writing involves following this work in others. Lyotard's constantly tracing this threshold in the work of something, watching how the artist or the thinker is moving to the limits of, of that threshold. But this work of explication, analysis, was not simply one of commentary. It proceeded from his own exposure, exposure to those forms of exposure he followed in music, painting, or literature, his own opening to the infancy of the mind that he sought in art. His writing and his teaching were thus an attempt to communicate that exposure on the supposition or presupposition that such a communication was in fact possible, or as though it were possible, he would say. He was attempting to think that communication and to perform it each time he went there to that threshold. And that practice is what I would ultimately call a pedagogy of disaster. One might always want to emphasize that he undertook this pedagogy in order to resist an ambient disaster at the level of the world. If we can call devastation wrought by technique under the motor of capital, still worldly. So he was trying to resist an ambient disaster at the level of our world by approaching a disaster at the level of the world itself, seeking a form of resistance to the one by courting the other and leading others in writing and teaching toward it. And one might affirm that to the extent he sought to practice or to teach the one that attempt to think worldhood as such in, in this passage of going to the limit in order to resist the, the forces of capital and technology in the world that's defined for us. To the extent that he sought to practice or teach the one in order to resist the other, his practice, the pedagogy of disaster, had a political orientation, despite everything. I would not disagree with this point. I think it's an important one. But I would not ascribe this orientation as guided by some definable end or telos. Indeed, I would insist that Lyotard was practicing an interruption of such a relation if we understand this as a passage from and, form a th from and through a form of exile toward an eventual return to some restored political order that we could name human. The relation between the inhuman and the inhum inhuman, the relation between that inhuman of technique and the inhuman of infancy or the, the, the excess in the human, that relation between the inhuman and the inhuman as he explored and practiced it allowed no such dialectical recovery. The relation was what Blanchot would have named an interrupted or neutral one. And this brings us to the essential point I want to offer, finally, as I approach my end, with regard to the notion of a pedagogy of disaster. Namely, that if it is to be worthy of this name, it must be truly exilic. Its only truth will inherit in its eternally repeated passage outside, to what Lyotard obscurely designated with a minimal term, there. I believe we must be uncompromising on this point and resist the temptation to smuggle back some political comfort, even as we carry on our political efforts, but in attempting to continue to think in that process. I will add, however, that in those moments when I have thought that I actually engaged a pedagogy of disaster, in those moments I've experienced, strangely and enigmatically for me, the unmistakable presence of a growing ethical political urgency. That is to say, the more I have approached what I have referred to so loosely as the disaster, the more the imperative of a just response to human suffering or human vulnerability has come to the fore. And the more I have experienced the freedom to entertain the question of that justice. This is really, for me, a quite enigmatic thing. The more I go in this direction I'm describing, this practice of the, uh, the threshold, let's say, the more the question of justice presents itself powerfully and, and ineluctably. This is why I believe that one can say the pedagogy of disaster both releases in relation to the political and orients toward the thought of a political, ethical political relation that would maintain some form of non-forgetting with respect to the other. The other human being, but also other others, right? other, other forms of life. One might retort, how long do you think you, we can endure in this passage in the desert, given the effect 
of that other disaster that is unfolding in the socioeconomic sphere and that threatens to destroy the conditions of this form of pedagogy? I have no simple answer to that question beyond the one that Blanchot offered in acknowledging that a pedagogical stance which intervenes on the scene of representation with some political intention is in fact unavoidable and that one must therefore always practice a double stance. One must analyze and respond to the ambient disaster in critical terms, even while pursuing a more uncertain exilic path. One must carry the burden of this contradictory double imperative. Again, I wouldn't disagree with this, but I would suggest that it is our task to find ways to think the first path, which is the path of social critique and struggle, from the second. In other words, to make a pedagogy of disaster the ground, at least for some of us, for a constant disturbance of our political constructs and a constant reconception of them. We must trust the orienting and releasing movement that is given in the pedagogy of disaster and make the disclosure of the facticity of being with, our, this undercommons of our being with, the priming factor in all our proceedings. The path is a risky one, I think, but I believe it is the one indicated by a pedagogy of disaster. Thank you. <laughs>